pull it up on here. Do I across? Presentation mode. Uh, sorry, I can't apple. This is my machine right here. Let me get this out of the way. All right. So, uh, yep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Serena Napan, and I'm a network operations engineer at the Deep Space Network. The Deep Space Network is a network of antennas around the world um, that are used by any spacecraft that go beyond the moon. Um, so uh, it's completely managed by JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, which is a NASA center in Pasadena, for those of you who don't know. Who's heard of JPL here? All right, my people. Everyone else was eating, so like I know you guys all know. <laughs> um, but uh, it's been 50 years since we've been to the moon. July was the 50th anniversary. And before I go too far, I just want to ask, has any, does anyone here not believe that we landed on the moon? <laughs> that it was a hot, all right. Someone please escort that woman out of here. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but we did in fact go to the moon. There's a lot of tracking data. Uh, there's even a book back there brought by my uh, friend who you'll uh, see later, Sarah, that has a, a book of commands that were sent out to the moon. And there's also some stickers too if you guys want to grab some back there. Um, but it was an uh, amazing engineering experience. And um, I'll talk a little bit about Apollo 11 and how the Deep Space Network evolved due to that. Um, so three really brave people went up in uh, July 16th and um, on the biggest rocket ever built. And they were, uh, they arrived on July 20th. Um, oh, it's gonna show. Okay, so I wasn't sure if this was gonna show, but I, I do wanna play, is there sound by chance? Is there, is there sound here? Okay. Uh, the, the Okay, that's okay, even if it's this, I, I wanted to point this out because a great movie's out, if you haven't seen it, Apollo 11, it's a documentary um, that's pretty much a movie made by um, un, like uh, never, be seen, never before seen footage of the actual Apollo crew, um, and it's amazing. And the whole narration is um, uh, like just the communication lines, and I really recommend that you see it if you haven't, who's seen it here? All right, you guys are my people. Okay, so. Do not bring SpaceX into this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but the Saturn V is much bigger than the heavy. Much bigger. It is the biggest rocket ever built. Yes, a lot of people forget, but yeah. And uh, with a lot less technology. So I, I really recommend that you see it if you haven't seen it. Um, but it just shows the amazing engineering marvel that was Apollo and uh, all the pain that people had to go through for this mission. It's intense. The sound effects are really crazy. I heard if you uh, if you listen to it on IMAX, you actually feel the vibrations of the launch. It's so intense. Okay. So, moving on. And this is just a uh, video on YouTube if you guys want to see it. Too. Look at that. It's massive. So, seeing this as a kid, I'm sure uh, some people in the crowd know, it inspired a lot of um, people to become engineers. And um, not only that, but a lot of fun, um, a proof of concept was shown, and there was a lot of funding for future space missions. Um, and lastly, there was a lot of like national pride. So I actually had a friend tell me that she was uh, abroad while the landing happened, and people went up to her and shook her hand and congratulated her for that sort of thing. Uh, and I think that's just a, such a powerful story uh, that makes you feel really proud of where you're from. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm ju I've just listed three here, but there has been so much technology that developed because of the Apollo missions. And a lot of people forget, they're like, oh, we went on the moon, like we didn't really do anything, what was the point? A lot of technology was proven um, because of this. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about specifically the DSN, um, but some of the examples were like alternative energy, like they, they learned how to use like methane as an alternative energy of solar power, of course. Uh, firefighters were affected by this. Uh, they, they revamped firefighter suits. Um, and boot mo uh, moon boot material, which if you haven't looked it up, I highly recommend. Uh, so this famous quote was said um, and transmitted through one of the Deep Space Network antennas and um, it became legendary. Um, 
And uh, before I get too deep into talking about the involvement of the DSN, and I'm sorry for anyone here who knows a lot about the DSN, I'm looking at you, Chris, uh, let me just talk a little bit about it. Um, so the Deep Space Network is a network of um, antennas around the world, and um, it's governed by JPL mostly, uh, but since other foreign entities are involved, um, uh, they work all together. They're placed 120 degrees equidistant from each other so that as the Earth rotates, uh, you have complete coverage uh, of all your spacecraft. And we are constantly transmitting radio frequency signals um, all day, every day. Uh, some of the antennas here are listed. Um, this famous quote, capturing whispers from space, is often used to explain how the DSN works um, because uh, you're really capturing very low signals from very far away places. If you guys have heard of Voyager, of course, uh, that is uh, the furthest spacecraft away that's um, barely transmitting, and they're still doing it, and it's actually exceeded a lot of people's expectations. Uh, the Goldstone Complex, uh, one of three, is um, pretty unique in the sense that a lot of antennas were developed just for the Apollo program, uh, and they were even named uh, after the different uh, missions that it was after. Um, so you'll see like the Mars missions were created for, the, uh, for that, and um, some are out of commission. Uh, but I'd like to point out DSS-12, which is a station that was only developed to shoot out signals to bounce off of the moon, to uh, categorize the moon and pick a good location. And that was years. That was like in, um, in the early 60s. Um, so... Another famous quote, don't leave Earth without us. You build your spacecraft and everything is working good, but if you don't have communications, then what's the point? And a lot of people forget that uh, um, all of those pictures that you see, um, the way that people keep their uh, spacecraft health data is all through the Deep Space Network. Uh, so these are some of the service services uh, that we provide, telemetry, command, tracking, radio science. Uh, radio science is used to like find far away pulsars. Please don't ask me about that, although it seems very interesting. It's it's pretty science-y, um, uh, but pretty much any time we want to communicate to a spacecraft, receive information from it, or command it to, uh, to do something, um, you need that. Here are some of my favorite pictures. Uh, I chose this picture to show you the massiveness of the, deep, of the 70 meter antenna that's in Goldstone. And each uh, complex has its own 70 meter. Um, this was built and increased in size for the Voyager project. So the bigger the antenna is, the further it could transmit. Um, the bigger the antenna is, the smaller the beam width, so the more accurate it can be. And um, me and my coworkers are standing here way above the fence. So this is like a 12-foot fence maybe. Um, and this picture still doesn't do it justice. It's, a, it's an engineering marvel. Um, the bearings on this thing is like the size of the screen maybe. Um, and on the right is the beam waveguide antenna, which is a new sort of uh, more innovative way to build antennas that has all the electronics built underground. And what they're able to do now is um, array these antennas instead of using such a big antenna um, and accomplish the same things. But we're not going to take down that antenna, of course. Um, yet another famous quote, from the desert to the stars. Uh, so again, I, I said anything that goes beyond the moon, but um, uh, uh, these were necessary to provide 24-hour, seven-day coverage, seven days a week coverage for the, um, for the astronauts that went up there. Um, although JPL manages the deep space network right now, uh, back in the day they had their own missions to track. So, uh, so they had built uh, a parallel operations center in Goddard, and that's actually where they did all of their communications from. Um, and... I think that's it for that one. Uh, even though JPL did not do so much of the, um, the commanding, a lot of technology was developed by JPL. Um, they developed hard landings, which was uh, the Mariner missions, if you guys are familiar. Uh, the Mar Mar Mariner missions were built to crash into the moon and take pictures right before it crashed. And they failed many times, like six times, before they actually uh, successfully accomplished it. And if you guys are familiar with the peanut story at JPL, then that, that's where that developed from. Um, and another thing was the soft landing. So uh, um, the, uh, the crashing into the planets, which were called the Rangers, um, 
were built by JPL, but next time around, JPL decided to contract Hughes uh, aircrafts to build their surveyors. And, um, uh, and the landing system in that went on to be part of the landing system for the, uh, for the rovers that went on the moon. Um, something that I forgot to mention that's worth mentioning. Who's, who's here is electrical engineering? On your out there. Okay, nice. So continuous transmission was uh, developed for the Apollo missions. So before they had these interlock, uh, inter interlock switches that would uh, disable. And they actually had to do a lot of engineering type of research to create um, a switch that would bypass all of that and that would keep the klystron, uh, which is the transmitter, transmitting until meltdown. Um, so that was pretty crazy. And um, although we don't have this awesome antenna anymore, there was a, a auto tracking antenna, which the Air Force uses now to track everything that goes on the sky. And that was developed so, um, again, for the safety of the men that went on the moon. Okay. So we went on the moon. Does anyone know what year we went on the moon last time? 72. Okay, okay. I'm trying to gauge my trivia question for later because I have this prize mug. And I don't know if I can. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll go hard. Uh, but yeah, so last time we were there was 1972. And um, uh, they're, they're planning for a lot more coming up. Uh, the reason we haven't been back there, of course, because this is expensive. Um, but uh, right now we're building a rover, Mars 2020. Um, if you guys have a chance to go to JPL, it's something to see right now. They're about done with the rover. and. Um, it's, it's a pretty amazing mission. When, when the men went to the moon, they collected 47 pounds of, sample of, uh, of, of moon samples. And it was very expensive to get one of those moon samples and study them. And a lot was found about the moon and our planet. A lot of stuff was assumed that was disproven when we found these materials. Um, so similarly, the Mars rover will collect samples and help future um, men or people on the Mars. I meant humans. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, there is a, a bit of an error here. Ignore the, the, the year, so I'll explain it. 2020 coming up, they will test the Orion capsule. Who's heard of the Orion capsule? Okay, nice. It is, uh, it is going to be what holds men on the moon coming up. So um, they will do like a, a test of the capsule and um, a test of the uh, space launch system. And in 2022, they'll actually have people crewed on the, sh on the capsule and they'll um, orbit the, uh, the moon and come back. And in 2024, people will land on the moon once again after many, many years. Um, depending on how that mission goes and how things happen, so again, ignore these dates, but pretty much from 2024 to 2030, um, they'll do a series of experiments that will determine what we should do next. And um, the, the really unique thing about this is they are putting women on Mars, so that's uh, already slated to happen. Uh, Woohoo! <laughs> All right. And the, uh, there's also a lot of like commercial involvement, so a lot of private industry is getting involved in this, which uh, would have never happened back, back then. Um, and watch out for this, because um, right now they are actually also building the, uh, a gateway a space station that will orbit the moon. To, to help be a, a stop point, a waypoint for, for the astronauts. Um, and I, I wanted to end my talk here, short and sweet, but uh, uh, this is a picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and, um, and what's his name, Neil Armstrong. Um, <laughs> they're, in the, they're in the capsule here uh, for decontamination and they were answering interview questions. Uh, in this picture, they look so happy, um, but I wanted uh, to end this quote, which I'm not gonna try to say, uh, but it's pretty much a rough road leads to the stars. Um, and many people died before coming to this. Um, and to be one of these men that actually got to go up and see all of their friends that they were in flight school with die in front of them due to uh, oxygen accidents or uh, what have you, uh, was probably a really powerful feeling. Uh, so I'll end right here. And um, if you have questions, I'll try to answer, but I should let you know that I've only been two years into the job, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you know a lot more about the Apollo mission than me. <laughs> All right, thank you. What's the, close, what's the closest uh, antenna? 
to us. To us. Um, so it's they're all in one station uh, in Barstow. There is a military base there, Fort Irwin, which trains um, all the army uh, chapters, and uh, that is like two and a half hours away. It's really hard to get in there. Um, but if you ever have a chance to go, you should totally go. If you're ever in Australia, I heard there's a hike trail where you can actually see the antennas, so that might be possible. There's like a big antenna like on the way to Mammoth. On the oh, is, is it a, are you sure it's not an observatory? Is it a parabolic antenna? Caltech. It's a Caltech antenna? Okay. Yeah, so um, actually an, uh, a bunch of antenna, uh, different antennas in like Bermuda and uh, different places were used for the for this, but the, the Deep Space Network, although there are some missions that uh, are close to the moon or even that are um, uh, circling, er circ circling Earth that are around uh, still use it, but that's just because they're afraid that they're, they're tech. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Just one second. I can give you this. Oh, sorry. Do you know what uh, band or what frequency they usually use for the, this kind of communication? Yeah, so we do S-band, X-band, and K-A-band. Uh, K-A-band's uh, less used, so about like 32 gigahertz. Um, S-band's about 8 gigahertz. And there's, uh, I'm sorry, that's X-band, and then S-band is around 2. The same, well, I guess they must have changed that a lot over the years. Uh, well, it, of course, it varies from mission to mission. Um, but uh, um, I'm pretty sure that S-band, X-band... And KA band were like uh, structures, so it's a it's a government regulation, right? Uh, but m most missions nowadays use X band, uh, but there's some some close ones um, uh, that use S. Yes, sir. So I'm not an electrical engineer, so I'm not going to ask such I a forgive you. question. <laughs> but um, so, how do you describe your your mission? Like, what are you doing, and who are you doing it for? And can you talk about some recent? Findings, discoveries, epiphanies. Yeah, uh, so I, I guess I would describe it as, I, I always want to say, like, I'm in space exploration. You know, that's my deal. Like, I, um, uh, so anything that, uh, any sort of scientist that works on a project, they have a science degree, and they have certain goals and, and accomplishments that they want to do with their spacecraft. So um, they come to NASA, and they're like, we have this idea. It's going to be really cool. We're going to study the sun, and we're going to find out all these things about our, the origins of our, of our life. Um, and they have to approve themselves. And once they get approved, they work with people from the DSN to plan their uh, their usage of the antenna. So they, you know, they say like, we need this much time. Can we get it? Of course, they have to pay up for it. But in addition to that, they have to um, they have to make sure and be compatible with our antennas. So they actually test their receivers and. Uh, um, and, and, and prove their compatibility, I guess, uh, because everything has to be guaranteed. Um, so some, some interesting discoveries. Um, I, let's see, that, that's the mistake, people. I'm, I'm not on the science side at all, um, but I did work on this mission called uh, Solar Probe, which is traveling the closest to the sun that any other mission has. Um, I think the last time someone was near the sun, it was like around 12, 20 million miles, Tim, right? Something like that. Uh, so, they're, so they're getting very, very close, and um, discoveries will happen soon. I'm going to get back to you on that. I know him, so it's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So you work for the DSN, so you might have some insider no knowledge. It's know classified. How. It's classified. <laughs> I tell you, but I have to kill you. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so I know the Insight Lander was, uh, was trying to use uh, the DSN for science. It was trying to look at, or it was trying to characterize the communications to see like the precession and nutation of Mars. Um, are you aware of like any plans for that anytime soon? I do not okay. have any idea. So uh, the way that it works, um, different people have uh, assigned missions and I, I specifically wasn't assigned to Insight, but I'm gonna ask some coworkers and get back to you. Cool, All right. thanks. Yes, sir. Um, so I heard that there is kind of a, an accident where a bunch of tardigrades were accidentally spilled yes. onto the moon. Yes, we're all troubled by it. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering um, <clears throat> when, like, is that going to mess things up later on when we're looking for That's aliens? That's a great question. <laughs> I was just joking to someone today that the tardigrades are going to infect and somehow they're going to, like, consume stuff from the moon and become giants and come back and attack us. Um, t tardigrades are, you guys have heard of tardigrades. Are they mammals? They're, they're species, they're, yeah, there's some sort of like uh, 
creature that could survive in any environment proven. So any, um, like in space, in water, and in, in regular land. Uh, so there was an Israeli mission that crashed on the moon and they had tardigrades there and they were going to, um, they were gonna keep them there and study the effects. Uh, but because they crashed, they were all released on the moon. A lot of people said that they just died on impact. But yeah, I, I believe there are lies also. But we'll see. I mean, we're going to go to the moon, so that's probably the first place we're going to check out. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And the purple hair. Here you go. <laughs> purple hairist. <laughs> um, what is your strongest role, you would say, your DSN network <laughs> communication plays in the launching of satellites? Okay, I, uh, I think it's very important uh, to, to be able to communicate with scientists. A lot of the times it's pretty intimidating talking to someone with a PhD and they're, they're looking to you for information. And although it seems like simple enough to you, you have to express it in a, in a, I think like in a, in a manner where they understand it and where it doesn't seem offensive. Um, so I think I would say um, talking to my audience would be my strongest suit right there. And that's engineering, believe it or not. Oh. Yes, sir. I got you. <laughs> Here we go. Right. Keep, this one's mine, that's right. It's warm and warmed up for me. <laughs> okay. okay, so on the follow-up to that the Israeli mission, how many uh, um, DSN equivalents are there uh, up and running? Because the Chinese would have had one for their lunar mission. Israeli would have had something else for other missions. You mean like an equivalent to the spacecraft or like the, that? The DSN network, the antennas, the radar, uh, the dishes. Okay, so... The China, we don't support any Chinese missions, right. by the so, way. So, so they must have one. Do the Russians must. have one? Do the Indians have one? Do the um, Israelis have one? Yeah, so there's a uh, there's the Near-Earth Network, which you might have heard of, which is also uh, controlled by the U.S., uh, so that's for anything close by. And almost all of the missions have their own ground stations. And what they do is, again, because the Earth rotates and they're going to be out of view, they'll plan their mission timeline to be when they can use their antennas. So there's actually no network, or like the, I'm not bragging here because it's the DSM, but there really isn't a network because it took a lot of government um, you know, bonds and, and handshakes to, to get that going. Um, so what I think the Chinese do, I don't know, I'm sure they wouldn't tell us, but it's like uh, uh, they plan out their missions to, uh, uh, their, their critical activities to happen when they're, when they're in view. Yeah. But we'll see, I'm, I'm gonna ask someone. Yeah. Can I take one more over okay. here? Uh, how long does it take to uh, build the telescopes and who pay for it? That's a very good question. Yeah, so uh, so these are um, like radio telescopes and they're very expensive. Um, I want to say like one costs like six million. No, 60 million. Tim, shake your head yes or no. It's my coworkers over. Okay, it's something like 60 million. It's really expensive. And actually, something that I didn't mention is these... Back in, in, in those days, maybe they had seven missions going on, and of course not many um, foreigners used the DSN because there wasn't any foreign space agencies. Right now there's JAXA, which is the Japanese space agencies, ISRO, which is the Indian space agency, and ESA, the Europeans. Um, uh, but now there's about 40 plus missions using the DSN at a time, and it's, it's really over, it's overused, and uh, they're, we're all constantly begging to build more antennas. Uh, but the 70 meter took about five years to build, um, and then at first it was a 64 meter and they modified it and made it into a 70 meter. Um, and I want to say it cost $60 million, but I feel that it may be more, but I'm gonna get back to you on that one too. Very expensive. All right, thank you. Ooh.